Hello, everyone, and thank you for being here today. Uh, we're going to get started in just a couple of moments. It looks like people are still coming in, so please give us just a moment. Thank you. And for those who are new to the Pre-Sales Collective webinar, welcome. Uh, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A and the chat feature. We do like to make these very conversational. We'll pop up a couple of Zoom um, polls, ask you to fill those out, and then we're going to get started. It looks like we still have a number of people still moving in, but I, I do, for the sake of time, want to get started. So um, thank you all for being here today, growing and scaling pre-sales and hypergrowth. I don't know about you, but I'm really excited about this topic. I'm really excited for the panel that we have today and uh, really excited to get into it. Before I do so, I just wanna take a moment to thank all of you for making Presales Collective possible. We started the Presales Collective about two months ago and we've been blown away with the amazing communal effort, collaboration, everyone unifying under one roof. Uh, it's really been great. What started as an idea for a couple of blogs and a webinar series has turned into three blogs a week, a weekly webinar series, a discussion board, a Slack. Um, we're working on some really cool events and groups that will be coming to the pre-sales community. And really want to just say thank you all, because this doesn't happen without your energy, your effort, and your attention to this community. So I just want to say thank you again. And as we get started, as always, we really want to understand our audience today. So I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. Launch a poll. So please choose the option that best describes your current role, just so we can understand our audience today. Looks like we have a good mix between leaders and ICs. Looks like more leaders today than individual contributors. We also have a, a good percentage of people in pre-sales are interested in coming to pre-sales and thank you to the one account executive that we have on here so far. <laughs> I always love when our sales counterparts are here to support. So as we'll leave that pull up for just another minute or two, uh, but want to get into our topic, growing and scaling pre-sales and hyper growth. Um, I'm really excited here today because we have a great panel of people who've been through some really amazing experiences um, and I'll be introducing them in a moment. But what we want to make sure today is we talk about how to stand out in a growing organization, hiring advice for early stage startups and, hype, and, and companies in hyper growth, the idea of builders versus scalers, and organizational leadership models. Again, these are just a few of the takeaways that we want to get through today, but, but I wanted to make sure we, re, we frame the conversation for how we're going to approach today. Right before I, I, or one second before I announce everyone, I'm just going to go ahead and end the poll. And it looks like we have about 45% um, leaders here today, 39% SC, <coughs> SCSAs, and 11% uh, interested in pre-sales. So thank you all for being here. Um, so let me go ahead and start to briefly introduce um, our panel, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves. Uh, but we're here with Steve Her Herskovitz, Kathy Abruzzetti, and Thomas Bisser. And, and all three have been a part of amazing journeys and amazing experiences. So I'd ask them to all introduce themselves and maybe give a little bit of a, an example of your experience and hyper growth uh, in your introduction. So let's actually start with Steve. Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you for attending. Um, I'm based in San Francisco. I was lucky enough to join Snowflake as the first SE. Um, I grew the team in North America, then launched EMEA, and then launched APEC. I led the team globally. Um, through a period of in very intense hypergrowth until it reached about 170 people. For the last year, I have focused on global expansion, which at Snowflake meant new geos and new capabilities. I'm just back from spending six months living in Tokyo, helping Snowflake get sales started in Japan. Ironically, I've only been in pre-sales for about 10 years. I spent most of my career as a software engineer, as a consultant, 
and I accidentally became a sales engineer at my previous job. Thanks, Steve. The accidentally becoming a pre-sales uh, <laughs> seems to be a common theme. Uh, it really does. I, I say the same thing. So, uh, Kathy or KJ, would you like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. Thank you for having me on today, and good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kathy Abrazetti, or um, also everybody calls me KJ, as James indicated. And um, I'm currently the director of America's East and Public Sector Solution Architects at Avanti. I'm based in Washington, D.C. And um, I also accidentally fell into pre-sales and, and eventually pre-sales leadership uh, over 25 years ago. And um, I've got some great stories about pre-sales in the old days that I'd love to share at some point. Um, but I've had the opportunity to work in several companies that have gone through explosive, both explosive growth as well as rapid reduction. And um, some of those companies had organic growth like ServiceNow where I grew and led the Americas um, team to about triple in size. Uh, ShareWell Software where I led and grew the global solution consulting team, as well as acquisition fueled companies such as Peregrine HP Software, and now Avanti. That is an amazing resume of, of hyper growth. I like to call this the Game of Thrones intros, right? Like it's like, you know, first of the name and, and queen and king of this. So I really like that. Thank you, KJ. <laughs> Thomas, how about you round us out? All right. Thanks, James. And uh, thank you to, uh, to Steve and Kathy and everybody that, that's joined. I see some familiar names out there. So hopefully we have some good conversation. Um, hi, John Kerr. It's nice to see you as well. Uh, so my name is Thomas Beezer, and um, I'm the, the VP of America's pre-sales at Okta. I'm based out of Boulder, Colorado. I was uh, fortunate enough to be one of the first SEs at Okta, uh, joining back in 2012. And I've had the opportunity to build and lead multiple teams from scratch at Okta, um, our, our, what we call commercial um, which is really SMB, uh, our enterprise business, named accounts for us, you know, that, that's Fortune 500 or Global 2000, uh, federal, SLED, um, partnerships, as well as proposal management and renewals, all in the context of uh, pre-sales. Prior to Okta, I was at HP for, uh, for five years through the acquisition of uh, Opsware, which was another great company to, to work for. And I've, you know, along the way, worked for a number of other startups, I've got some war stories for sure, and uh, have also worked at places like uh, Sun Microsystems and Storage Tech in the past. Perfect. Thank you, Thomas. Appreciate that experience as well. I'm definitely looking forward to getting into things. Um, as we do that, we're going to actually start with one more poll. So let me go ahead and launch this poll. And it's a little bit of an interesting question, but I want to know if you've been promoted to leadership from an individual contributor role within your current organization? The answer would be yes. Or if you're still an individual contributor or you came from leadership from another company, please answer this no. All right. Looks like we're in about the 30, mid 30% 30 uh, of people who've actually come from leader, I, an IC role to a leadership role within their organization. Looks like we got about 70% of people who voted, so perfect. Uh, that's great. I really like that perspective and we'll try to incorporate that in today. So what we're going to do is we have a number of, of questions that we want to uh, talk about with, with Steve, uh, Kathy, and Thomas. But again, we want to make this conversational. As we ask, feel free to add questions to the Q&A. Uh, go ahead and send them through chat. I'll be monitoring throughout. Uh, but we're going to go ahead and start with a question uh, geared around individual contributors. And the, you know, what are the top two or three key strengths of your top performing individual contributors slash what are you looking for that stands out? Um, and we can go ahead and start with, uh, with Steve on this question. Thanks, James. So when I'm uh, hiring, when I'm interviewing, I look first and foremost for a customer orientation. I want um, candidates who have shown a track record of caring about how their product was used at um, the customer, how it solved problems. I want them to be thinking about solving problems more than about selling product. Second, I'm very interested in their level of curiosity. I, of course, expect them to really understand their own product well, but I look for them to be willing to uh, 
and interested in exploring the customer's business. And so you can see this during an interview about whether they ask any questions of, um, of me and about how my company does its work. That demonstrates their curiosity towards whoever they're talking with. And then um, I also like to understand a candidate's career trajectory. I want to know how they, how they took each step that's on their resume. I don't want the details particularly from each job, but I want to know what did, you, what did you go to that company to learn? Did you learn what you had hoped to learn there? Why did you eventually decide to leave? Why are you thinking about leaving where you are right now? And why are you interested in my company? So in general, I'm looking for people who propel themselves through their own careers. I want self-motivated, self-starter, self-sufficient. I like that, Steve. And I really like the curiosity aspect, right? If you know, you're in an interview and somebody, you ask if they have any questions and they don't have any questions, it's kind of baffling, right? Um, yeah, I believe an interview really needs to be two-way. I am with you, absolutely. Thanks, Steve. KJ? Yeah, I absolutely agree with everything Steve just said. Um, I think the, the, probably the one thing I zero in on the most, um, well, experience, whether it's in the industry or in pre-sales in general, is always important. Um, for me, it's attitude, because I, I don't feel like I can teach attitude to somebody. Um, they either have it or they don't. And, and I think it's the, the people with the, the right attitude of, of jump in, and because and, pre-sales, is, it's, a, it's a chaotic uh, job. Um, and I think people who can jump in and roll up their sleeves and, and problem solve and have that right attitude at how they approach that, they're the ones who seem to thrive in, especially in high growth environments. Um, so if I zeroed in on one thing, I, I think it's, it always comes down to attitude. That's great. It's, you know, you kind of heard the no a-hole policy, right? Like that's, right. it really actually goes a long way uh, in that. Thomas, your perspective? Yeah, I, I agree with everything that, that Steve and Kathy shared. And so I had to put something different out there. But um, <laughs> I, I think what, what I would add is uh, one of the big values that we have in the company and pre-sales uh, as well as teamwork and collaboration. Um, anyone that's worked with me uh, is it, probably grown annoyed by me using those words constantly. But I think that if you've got excellent teamwork and collaboration, and as you're talking to someone, especially, you know, as Steve mentioned in an interview context, and you can see that somebody has that, that that's really critical because you want people that are going to not just think about themselves or their particular teams or regions, but someone that's going to elevate um, all of the experiences and skills of everybody. Um, the next thing would be communication skills. Um, you know, th there are certain things that are very difficult to teach somebody. Um, there, there's certain things that you can do to coach folks from a communication standpoint um, without a question, but somebody that brings that to the table, I think you know, definitely has a, a leg above other folks. And I think that one thing that we might talk a little bit later that's related to this is uh, political savvy, uh, because I think that's related to communication skills and really understanding the different motivations that people have, uh, because that, that kind of forms how you communicate with folks. And then the final thing is aptitude. Um, you know, I've seen some of the SEs that have grown the most uh, in our organization at Okta and others are those that maybe didn't necessarily have domain expertise, but there's something that I was able to pick up on in the interview process, for example, that showed that they had a really high level of aptitude. Um, so I think that that's critical as well. Oh, that's a great answer. I actually, I really like that. So I wanna go ahead and roll to our next topic. Um, which will be, we all know hiring is critical. And so do you have any best practices that you've used in your career to ensure you are hiring top talent as your organization grows and scales? And so uh, I think Thomas, uh, we could start with you on this one. All right, great. Yeah, so I think that, um, you know, what, what I think about is, uh, you know, w w with hiring specifically, what, what we do is we look at, um, you know, people that have the ability really to, um, you know, to dig in and people that, you know, have the ability in, in the context of an interview panel specifically, um, we really want to see, you know, with, with different internal stakeholders, um, we, we want to know if people are going to trust them or not. Um, so I, I, I don't know if that's getting to the heart of the question, but um, that, that's one of the things that sticks out to us. 
maybe you could reframe the question. I'm not sure if I'm hitting the nail on the head or not. No, I, 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 oh, I think it makes sense. Uh, I think that's, that perspective is fine. Um, KJ, would you like to add anything there? Absolutely. I think you mentioned earlier about, um, you know, we, we, a lot of us tend to accidentally fall into, into pre-sales. And so um, I, first and foremost, I love to hear people's journey of how they got to into pre-sales and, and what drives them in pre-sales. But I think, um, you know, a couple of key things I look for. One is uh, too many times I think we rush through the interview process because we're just trying to get a spot filled, filled. And I think it's really important to take the time to get to know the people that you're hiring. Um, uh, you want to make sure that you are bringing the right people onto the team with that right attitude. And it's, you can't do that in just a couple of, of you know, quick interviews. Um, and so I really try to get to know them. I also, I believe firmly that everybody has kind of a superpower and I try to understand, you know, what their superpower is that they're going to bring to the table and to the team and, and, and be able to contribute. Um, and I think uh, somebody else, saw, and it might have been Steve also said that, um, uh, you know, they're interviewing us as much as we're interviewing them. So it, it has to be a right fit for, for both of you. And I think, in that interview process, as many people as you can get to interview them and and um, provide input and that they get to meet to see uh, who they're going to be working with across different organizations within your company um, to kind of get a good feel for the people and the culture and whether or not it's a good fit, I think are, are all important. Um, but at the end of the day, I ask myself one question and um, and if I can't answer yes to it, then <laughs> then I don't think they're the right fit for us. And that is, would I stake my career on that person, right? Because I think um, every single, period sales is such a critical role in any company. And I think every single person that you bring onto the team makes such a difference. And if you're not getting the right people, uh, you know, you've been, it's a problem. And so I always ask myself, would I stake my career on this person and having them on my team? And um, if the answer is yes, then, then hopefully they join. Yeah, that, that's a good perspective. And I, I love the superhero because I actually was just on LinkedIn and did some videos around asking leaders what they thought their best employee super, uh, superhero power was, you know? I think one of the things too that you bring up is putting your career on somebody because I think we all know that a, a bad hire or a, a wrong fit can actually be pretty devastating to an organization, especially if you're in a small organization. And I think they sometimes say, you know, you're, you're as strong as your weakest, you know, dog, weakest horse, you know, whatever that might be. And I, I think sometimes uh, that mentality happens and it, you know, it is hiring is really important. I think one of the things I want to highlight too is here sometimes, yeah, you have such a need to hire and it's like, we got to hire, rush, rush, rush. And then people complain about the length of the hiring process. But I think we all know that you got to get the fit right. You got to get the fit right because you'll spend so much time trying to course correct, training somebody, onboarding them and it's not successful it really can put a little dent in your overall progress. Absolutely. All right. Um, let's move on to the next uh, question, which will be um, builders versus scalers. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna leave the question up for a moment and then I'm gonna set, post it in the chat as well. I just wanna make sure that you can see all of our panelists uh, when they're giving their answers. So um, for me, when I look at this is some people are naturally built to be builders who can start organizations from scratch and others are naturally scalers, people who can refine, adapt and scale processes for efficiency. So I kind of want to ask, you know, what are the characteristics of each and Steve, we can start with you. Yeah. So I've actually developed some fairly strong opinions about this recently. I think, um, I think builders are fearless about starting from a blank sheet of paper, from solving the unsolved, from creating processes where there are no precedents. On the flip side, I think scalers are fearless about looking at the way things are currently being done and finding room for improvement. They are not intimidated by, oh, but this is how we've always done it. And the, the biggest issue I see between them is not that there are these two different types, but that they don't appreciate what each other brings to the table quite enough. Um, my analogy would be that the, that the builders, you know, um, they blaze a first trail, they create a first town, and they should be appreciated for being the pioneers. But then the scalers, they see that path, they see that town, and they build a freeway. 
They bring in uh, railways, public transit, build skyscrapers, and that is equally important for continued development. So I think an organization needs both, and they ought to really appreciate each other's uh, strengths and skills a little bit more than, uh, than what I've seen. That is definitely a, a pretty uh, solidified opinion on this topic. <laughs> I, I definitely like it. So Thomas, do you want to add some color into this question? Yeah, yes, yeah, sir. I, I, I think Steve's got some great points. I, I've met people in my career who have the ability to build and scale, but I do think that they are the exception which proves the rule. I, I do think most folks tend to have um, a gravitation towards one of these or the other, um, but I do agree that they're both incredibly useful, I think, in all parts of an organization's growth, uh, because even it, as an organization is you know, growing very quickly at scale, you are still going to need people who can build things from scratch, whether they be um, you know, entering new markets or building new, uh, you know, niche teams. Maybe you make an acquisition and you need, you know, a, a small team of product specialists, for example. Those are examples of building in the context of an organization that's scaling. So I think that um, both are required. It's, it's uncommon to find somebody that's an A plus at both. I think that uh, builders are really able to analyze the landscape and understand the gaps and start running with it without needing a lot of a lot of clear rails uh, from their leadership. So they're not afraid to fail. So if you're looking for a builder, that's one thing that you're trying to identify and admonish is somebody that's really willing to go for it. But at the same time, you do want them to be savvy enough to understand how their decisions impact other people uh, with, without a question. And then I think finally for scalers, you know, they tend to be very intuitive and they can call upon past experiences where they've perhaps scaled out organizations in the past, um, or maybe they were part of something in the past, and, and they know the processes, they know the types of roles uh, and goals that are gonna be required to help the organization get to the next level of scale. Yeah, it's a good perspective, because you know what I think about like a builder versus scaler, builders, you have a lot more green grass, right? You can kind of do whatever you wanna do, run and go. Right. But once you start kind of scaling that ability to fail is a little bit less, right? There's a lot more repercussions uh, for your actions and it's, it's definitely a good perspective. Um, I'd like to continue on this, on this question um, and kind of expand it a little bit further and say, as companies grow, is there a natural progression where the bu builders give way to the scalers? And if so, what is that step? Um, KJ, let's start with you. Yeah. Um, so I, I have a running joke about um, that there's two types of people, right? I, I talk a lot about builders versus uh, move-in ready. And I think, I think builders and scalers both have some of those same um, traits that, that both Thomas and Steve were talking about um, versus kind of that move-in ready. But at the end of the day, it, it, you know, and I, I, I know I mentioned attitude earlier. It, it, I think it does come back to kind of people's attitude and whether or not they're problem solvers. Um, I've been in many, many companies that have, um, you know, practically replaced the entire uh, leadership teams to to help move from one level of growth to the next, and and um, and and I think it's kind of sad actually because I I think I'd love to challenge a company to be able to start from the beginning and build its employees as it builds the company to be able to continue to drive that growth from one milestone to the next and. And sometimes I don't think it's that you don't have the right people in place, but rather you didn't instill or inspire that growth mindset from the beginning to um, and guide your leadership team to help plan for the future versus just managing for the moment. So I think when you have a team of people that are bought into the vision, that are passionate about the company, that are, are on that journey with you, um, then that's one of the best assets any company can have. And I think if you can build and grow your employees while you're building and growing your company, uh, then at the end of the day, I think that's what brings the success to, to your company and to your customers. I really like that KJ, because I think so many times we blame the employees, but really it's the organization or the organizational culture that has kind of led to where we're at. Right. And it's easy yeah. to say, Oh, let's just replace the employees, but it's probably a little bit higher level than that. You know, um, Thomas, your perspective on this. Yeah, yes, sir, James. So I, I want to build on the, the last set of thoughts I had. I, 
I do think that, again, that there are builders who have the ability to learn to scale if they haven't done it before. So I don't necessarily think that these need to be separate people or roles. But um, as I alluded to, I, I, I think there's a minority which not only has, you know, both skill sets, but really enjoy wearing both hats. Um, in addition to that, if we assume that uh, the theories around organizational growth are accurate, um, a lot of folks will say there's five stages of the growth of any organization. And what you can look at is that early in an organization, it's growing through, you know, leadership cre creativity and direction. But as you get to phase three in a lot of these models, a leader needs to really learn how to delegate responsibilities. And this is where many builders really struggle. And if, if you can't effectively delegate, um, it'll, it'll really be tough for you to lead out the scale that you need for an org because you can get stuck in the more tactical, um, if you will. And if a leader struggles with the delegation piece, um, stages four and five of these growth model theories, um, which require strong coordination and collaboration with leaders from other teams, it, is really impossible because you're getting too bogged down. So I'd say that the, the later three stages in uh, the organizational growth theories have crucial skills that are required for an organization to, to really scale. Um, and, and that's what an individual needs to be able to do that effectively. That's, that's a great perspective. And, and Brian Cody, if that answered your question, send me a chat and let me know. We got a couple of questions around this and we're going to actually touch on this subject a, a little bit further here in a second. So um, moving forward on, on the questions, um, and this one is, is kind of near and dear to me, right? Because I, I personally grew up in startups. I've spent most of my career in startups being the first employee, first pre-sales person and knowing the space, knowing the product and helping build and scale. I've moved to a company like Salesforce where there's uh, a lot more layers of, of management, right? And a lot more layers to our overall organization. And so the question is, is that they're now increasingly common to hire professional managers who don't know the product, they don't know the space, but they have the general management experience for scaling processes. I would add, maybe they can manage the most out of their employees. So what are some of the pros and cons to this model? Steve, let's start with you. Yeah, so I think that you absolutely need these professional managers to get the scale you need. The, the homegrown managers, they know the product really well, but they don't really, they haven't seen all those personnel situations. They haven't figured out how to, uh, how to um, perhaps interview properly, how to do the firing side of interviewing, um, so of, uh, of recruiting as well. So it's important that you do have that. The, the flip side though is that um, in, a, in an early organization where, you've, where you have grown from within, your managers and maybe even your skip level manager is able to come into a meeting and add value. So a frontline IC is able to uh, invite their managers in uh, when they need more horsepower in a meeting. When you have professional managers, you can't do that any longer, right? So you're, you, you gain something, but you also, there's a trade-off. And um, I think what's important is that at the beginning, when a company is first starting out, you must have player coach types who can play both roles. Uh, even if maybe they are not the best managers. But at a certain scale, you definitely need professional managers. And it's at that time that you have the, you have the need as well as the budget, if you will, to specialize and to find, to basically create a new class of senior technical folks who can be brought in when you need that extra horsepower in a customer meeting. Great perspective, Steve. Thomas? I love this topic. Um, so, so I would say one of the things that team members are often concerned about, um, you know, imagine you're an SE, is if their leader can really empathize and truly understand the, the challenges of their work, right? As an SE, by nature, the work tends to be very technical. And I think that it, it can be very difficult for a manager from the outside without that set of product experiences to really demonstrate empathy um, to somebody. I'm not saying it's impossible, um, but I do think it can be difficult. And this can be a con. Um, and, and I'm a firm believer that you cannot lead people where you haven't been yourself. Um, you can lead them in other areas where you have been, but you, know, you, you can't do it where you haven't been. And so this is a con that I've seen in hiring leaders from the outside. 
Again, it doesn't mean it's impossible, but it's a challenge. And I would say that one of the pros of hiring from the outside on the flip side would be is that there are leaders with incredible experiences who can really challenge the status quo and give you a new set of eyes and they can help you scale your teams and business to new heights um, that you weren't able to experience in the past. And, it, you know, it's very challenging for someone who's always been part of the organization to do that because they may be very entrenched in the company's, you know, traditions, if you will. And, and so that's one of the values of bringing someone from the outside. And then to wrap it up, I would say that strong leadership experience shouldn't, you know, be understated because, at its core are the values of understanding people and how businesses operate. And those are essential. If someone from the outside has a really strong track record of helping companies get to the next level, even if they haven't been at that company for five to 10 years and know all the nuances of the products, they can still add immense levels of value, even without being a really technical leader, because they've been down the road before and they know what it takes you know, with their previous experiences to get the organization to the next level. I think you're muted, James. Oh, sorry, can you guys hear me now? What would yeah. be a Zoom meeting without, without uh, someone telling someone to get off mute? Um, good perspective, Thomas. KJ, would you like to add in here? Absolutely. I, I think um, both Steve and both Thomas make some great points and, and it's important to find that right balance between promoting internally which promotes career path for existing employees, as well as hiring externally and bringing in that outside perspective or additional skill set to the team uh, is always important. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm, I, I'll say it. I, I'll say it a hundred times. Your your sales engineering team is one of your most important assets, and if you don't have a manager, the right person in place who can inspire and, and motivate and empower them to go do their job, then, then you're missing out. And um, I, I truly believe it's, it's every manager's duty to, to make sure you're getting every ounce of potential out of every single employee every single day. And, and so at the end of the day, it's about putting the right person in that position, regardless of whether they're coming from the outside or, or whether they're being promoted from within. I, I love what the three of you just said on this. I think everyone else on this call does too, because we're getting tons of questions and tons of chats around it. So really, really good perspective. I want to take it um, again on this one and go um, a step maybe in the more detail around do organizations need a leadership model defining first, second, and third line of leadership? And we'll start with Kathy on this one. Yeah. I, I think it's always good to at least understand and have a basic blueprint of, of how software organizations grow, uh, including account segmentation, sales ratios, alignment, manager to individual contributor ratios. Um, but in my experience, change in sales organizations is constant and you have to be flexible and, and ready to change almost annually, right? Every new fiscal year, it seems like sales teams are, are slightly reorganizing territories or their model, their go-to-market model, and you have to be agile to adjust and change with that. Um, so as a leader, you should always be developing your top talent for future growth and planning your succession planning. Um, and and you know, I think being ready to promote those internal candidates where needed and also uh, look for those external candidates that you can bring in and add value to the team along the way. Thanks, KJ. Steve? Yeah, so I, I like what Kathy says about um, constant change. And I think when you're in hyper growth, that change can be even faster than you know, each fiscal year. You might find yourself from quarter to quarter realizing, oh, what we did last quarter, that was good, but it's not gonna get us through next quarter or the one after that. And so you do need to be um, willing to change. And I think, especially if you start, you know, my view is, you know, when you start really small, you don't want to, you don't want to behave like IBM when you just have a handful of people, right? So you want to have the right amount of process that suits the size of your organization and the challenge that you're facing. And um, in some ways, my bias would be towards to have just, just barely enough process to, to manage the size of your org and the challenge that you're facing so that you don't feel like you're 
you, the people don't ever feel like there's too much process and that there's um, that things are top heavy. It, I feel like it's better for them to feel like, oh, things are just a little out of control. We're just a little more successful than we thought we would be or than we, than we planned for. Let's figure out now how to cope with this new level. Um, uh, so I guess maybe I'm more uh, seat of the pants. Clearly I'm more of a builder than a scaler. Um, but uh, because this, because of my experience, this is sort of a weak spot in my personal knowledge. And when uh, the SE team got to a certain size at Snowflake, I intentionally hired um, a leader with big company experience who had seen the kind of growth or the, guy, the kind of systems that were needed by a team the size that Snowflake's SE team had finally grown to. And um, I'll just point out that that's another thing to recognize when you yourself need somebody who knows more than you um, about certain areas to supplement what, uh, what, your, what your experience entails. No, I think it's a great trait when you know what your blind spots are and you know that you can hire to that. Um, so Steve, you mentioned this uh, earlier and just kind of highlighted on it now. And I, I always tell, well, getting to know Steve in this process, I told him I was very jealous of the role that he, he previously had, um, traveling kind of the world, uh, opening up new offices, very interesting experience. So I just think it'd be a really good story just to hear about your experience, places that you went, um, you know, what was the culture adjustment like? Just give us some insights into that. Yeah, well, thanks, James. I feel very lucky. Um, so I was lucky to basically make a career change and become the first SE at Snowflake. And um, uh, at first I was just doing those normal SE things, right? We were trying to win our first customers, create our first processes, et cetera. But then at a certain point when uh, it became clear we were ready to start to hire and expand, my manager, who is now the CRO, asked me if I wanted to stay an individual contributor, if I liked the uh, the hand-to-hand -hand combat with the uh, customers, or if I wanted to um, do the management side of things. And I told him I wanted to try the management side of things. And he said, okay, great. From now on, 95% of your job is recruiting and hiring. And I'm like, oh, geez, okay. Uh, <laughs> and what I've learned is that, that that has turned out to be among the most rewarding Kind of experiences for me it is that spending as much time as I have doing the recruiting and the hiring, I learned a lot about the hiring process, a lot about the people I was hiring, and a lot about myself as well. Um, the model we followed was very organic. So we we built the team in North America, and we did not um, we built from the bottom up, if you will. So we would have as many IC. SEs as we needed to support the sales team. The sales team would actually split off um, managers at a much more frequent rate. They kind of had a model that said every, every four or five reps needed their own manager. The SEs were operating more, more like at twice that. And at one point I had 13 direct reports and I went crazy. Um, but we, we had the headcount really to just support the sales. And then we, we added managers when it became intolerable not to have them. And we grew in that manner. Um, in North America. We, at a certain point, we had some second line managers. We had just begun to have second line managers and we decided we were gonna launch in EMEA. My second line managers were strong enough that when we, when we launched in Europe, um, I went over for long periods of time to help get started there. So we would recruit over there remotely then we would go for in-person interviews. And then when those people started, we went for live training. And I would spend a month, for example, I spent a month in London, then a month home another month in London, a month home, um, uh, using Airbnbs instead of uh, hotels because you go crazy in a hotel for that length of time. Um, and uh, we repeated that experience for the most part in, um, in Australia, same way, except that was Sydney. In both cases, I spent three to four months living in territory uh, over, you know, over maybe five or six month period. And then more recently have done that in, uh, in Japan, where I moved to Japan for, for six months and uh, stayed there very intensely. Um, it's a, a tremendous privilege to be able to do this. I feel like I know not just the sales engineers at Snowflake all around the world, but I know their sales teams as well. Because um, part of my role was not just to hire, but to go out into the field on sales calls with everybody. And I learned a lot about the way people sell differently in different cultures. 
Um, I've sat through meetings in different languages trying to figure out how not to just be a potted plant at these meetings, um, but to you know, find a way to contribute. Uh, very challenging, but also super rewarding. Um, and uh, it's just been a, a, a tremendous experience for me. Um, what I would say is the key to this, uh, aside from getting lucky, the key to this is really to, to commit yourself to making, the, making this luck work out. And um, I, uh, I felt like I had to throw myself into it entirely to try and do it half-heartedly, just go for a week at a time here and there and try to manage remotely. Didn't seem like it would work. So I really, that's why I went and I lived there. Um, but I will say, I'm of an age where I was lucky. My kids, my kids had already grown by the time I reached this point in my career. So it's not like I had young kids at home missing me. Um, and in fact, I joke, my wife was at the point in her career that she was so busy that, um, that I would say, well, she didn't really notice until I was gone for two or three weeks. Um, and then she would realize, oh, Steve's not here. Um, so uh, I think it's important for all the things to line up to be able to operate in this way. And I just, I just say I was really lucky that they did. Yeah, that's, that's great, Steve. That, that is a great story. And thanks for giving us your perspective on that. I, lo I love the joke about your wife. That was pretty good. Uh, <laughs> um, I, so we're, we're coming up near the end of our, our uh, webinars. So before we do some audience Q&A, so again, if audience, if you have Q&A, you have questions, please send them over. We have a lot. So I will try to get through a couple of them. But on the Pre-Sales Collective, we always like to make sure that you you know, walk away with something for spending time with us today. So I want to ask each of you um, the question of, you know, we want to offer advice and help those that are in the shoes that you were in previously, right? right? Part of the Pre-Sales Collective is, is creating repeatability, creating a network so we're not always reinventing the wheel. So what is something you wish you knew when you were building and scaling teams? And we'll start with Thomas. All right, thanks, James. I, I think what, what I'll highlight is related to actually a couple things that came up in the, uh, the chat and the Q&A, and that's emotional intelligence. I, I think emotional intelligence is one of the strongest indicators of anyone's career success. If, if you haven't spent a lot of time looking into this topic, um, one of the experts in the field is Daniel Goleman. Uh, last name is G-O-L-E-M-A-N. If you just do some YouTube video searches, there's actually a great session where he's talking to Google engineers uh, several years back. And he actually says, if you want to be successful, how technical you are doesn't matter. What matters is how emotionally intelligent you are. And I think in leadership, part of emotional intelligence really overlaps with that nasty phrase, um, organizational politics that I alluded to earlier. And I, I think many think at the surface level that politics in the workplace are just bad and they shouldn't exist. But I actually think that's an oversimplification of what politics really are. Um, politics are really about the fact that different people have all sorts of various motivations. And for you to be successful as you grow your career, it's very important that you increase your own self-awareness, which is really the foundation for emotional intelligence, because as you increase your own self-awareness, that will allow you to increase your other awareness, if you will, so that you can really understand other people's motivations and, and what drives them. And the more that you grow in those areas, the more you're going to be able to naturally handle politics better, and you'll learn to negotiate with cross-functional leaders so that you and them can both accomplish what you're aiming for instead of feeling this uh, you know, combat toward other parties in the organization. And in the end, you're gonna be doing what's best for your customers and the company. Uh, and that's really what we're aiming for. And being savvy enough with workplace politics based on a really solid foundation of emotional intelligence, I think is a very important leadership skill. And it, it, as you move into different levels of leadership, it's, it, it's very important for you to become intuitive with those things. You're muted, James. Man, I, I'm, I, I got to use this new mic. I just got a new mic, guys. I hope I sound better, but I, I can't use the mute button very well, apparently. <laughs> Thanks, Thomas. Great perspective. KJ? Absolutely. I, I'd layer on top of, of what Thomas uh, mentions because um, business, regardless of what business it is, whether you're selling software, or whether it's your retail or, or health companies or 
um, government. It's business is about people. And at the end of the day, uh, both customers and employees. And it's important how companies treat people and how you as a leader treat people. And um, if you focus on the people, if you understand them, you inspire them, you engage them, you motivate them, then I think there's no limit to the success that will follow. But you've got to keep in mind um, every day, it's about the people. That's great. Thank you, KJ. Steve, want to wrap us up on this topic? Yeah, so what I would say is that Thomas and Kathy have both summarized kind of what I have learned the most in my transition from being an engineer to a sales engineer. And it's all about, it used to be that I felt like people are really problematic, but as long as I stick to my programming, I am in control. And uh, what I realized is that the, uh, the people side is actually, for me, it became more satisfying, uh, that I grew into understanding that even though it was much more of a messy proposition. It was uh, that much more rewarding to figure out what people's strengths were, uh, their superpowers, as Kathy put it, um, what the um, what the right way to use them was, what the right way to help them grow was, and that as long as they were doing what they loved and growing, then in then the right thing would happen for me. It became more of a uh, an, an outward looking uh, view of things. Um, beyond that, I would say to SEs. Don't focus on selling. Instead, focus on solving your customer problems. And be honest, not just with your colleagues, but be honest with your customers. Don't try to bullshit them. They know when you are. Um, and uh, and you, want to, you want to always be representing your product, your company, yourself, your team in as honest a way as possible. And as long as you do that and uh, you kind of behave in a principled, courageous way, then success will follow. Way to, way to wrap us up, Steve. That, that <laughs> sounds great. Um, I want to, like how I, I checked the mic, Thomas, was that good? Um, I want to just wrap up. I mean, thank you, Steve, Kathy, and Thomas for an amazing panel. This has been great. Uh, very impactful. Lots of questions from the audience. I know we're not going to get to many of them today, so we'll, we'll encourage some other mediums to get people active. Uh, but again, hopefully the takeaways today, you understood how to stand out in a growing org hiring advice for early stage, the concept of builders versus scalers and organizational leadership models. Um, because we know that we're coming up on time, I do want to just maybe ask each of you one quick question before we launch a poll and start wrapping up. Um, so I think a, a good, we've got a lot of questions here and it's, it's kind of hard to pick just one. I'm trying to find one that might apply to everyone. Um, if let's let's go with the question that we asked earlier around the poll. So for people that are in their current organizations, maybe they're individual contributors looking to go to that first level of management, or maybe they're that first level level of management trying to get to that second or third layer. Is there any type of advice, maybe a quick sentence or two from each of you that you would offer to people in this perspective or in that position? Thomas, maybe we can start with you. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think if what you're focused on is how do I move into management um, as an individual contributor, as an SE, what I would look at, first of all, is to make it really clear to your current manager or leader that that's something that you're really interested in. Um, some of the organizations in pre-sales that are a little more mature they may have some thoughtfulness around the notion of what we call uh, at ACA, a team lead. So a, a team lead for us is a player coach type role where somebody that's aspiring to management can start to take on some of those management type responsibilities without crossing any HR or legal lines. Um, so I would, I would do some investigation and see if that is something that's been built out in the organization. And then I would ask yourself some questions in terms of why do you want to do this? What, what are your real motivations? Um, for many people in certain pre-sales organizations, it's basically the only direction they feel like they can go, which is more of a organizational culture issue, I think, than anything else. Um, but I, I would say if you're going to decide to move down the management path, you're choosing to destroy your ego. Because if you were an incredible SE in the past that was constantly saving the day in significant accounts, you're not doing that anymore you're deciding that you're gonna put yourself at the bottom of the heap 
And your job is now going to be to elevate everybody around you. So if you're really driven by being the hero, trust me, as a manager, uh, as a leader, you're going to be doing 90% of the things behind the scenes that no one sees and no one gives you credit for. So you need to decide your ego is going to die. If you're not ready to do that, you may want to talk to your manager about another opportunity in terms of leadership, because I do think you can be a leader as an individual contributor. Um, and then finally, I, I would look at what type of relationship do you have with sales leadership? If it's very, very strong, then you're probably a good candidate. If you'd say my leadership, you know, relationships are not very strong, then I would work with a coach or your manager um, to figure out how you can build up those relationships. And I think that what I would also look at is for your specific reg region or segment that you're focused on, think about the initiatives that you can work on with your manager and take on to make a really big impact to, to get everybody to the next level so that you can start to be known as a thought leader within your region. That's great, Thomas. I always tell people when they ask about leadership, it's not about you anymore. And I also say you don't need a, a, a title to have power and influence within an organization. So great, great stuff, Thomas. KJ, would you like to add anything there? Yeah, I definitely, you know, I, I, I always say pre-sales consultants are, are everyday rock stars, everyday heroes, right? They go out and they conquer a, a, a demo or a POC or a sales opportunity. And, and, um, and I'm the first one to applaud those heroes when they come back winning, winning a big opportunity or, or solving a customer's problem. Um, but what I applaud even more are the ones who, who take what they do and bring it back to the team and elevate the team. And I think those are the people that are that that really you look to as your natural leaders and your natural future um, managers uh, in your pre-sales organization because they're the ones who do care about the team. And pre-sales, while it's about those everyday heroes, it really is a team a team sport. And um, when you can elevate the whole team, uh, that's when I think you have a lot of success. And um, so, I, you know, that's my recommendation, I think, is, is really make sure that what you're doing that's working and, and that's really good in the field, you're bringing it back to the team and, and you're elevating the whole team with you. Well, that's great. Team, it, it absolutely is about the team. Steve, would you like to take us home on this last question? Yeah, so a couple of things. So clearly there's a difference between leadership and management. I mean, they can be together, but they do not have to be. Um, and the best parts of leadership really play into that idea of it being a team sport. You might think of a leader as being the star, but not really. I think some of the best leaders are the ones who make everybody else around them feel like they are on a just a superpower team. And that team is not just your fellow um, pre-sales people. That team are your sales reps. That team are the product managers. That team is the customer support team, the success team. Everybody who you interact with, who interacts with the customer, you want to make everybody feel that their part is valuable. It is valuable, so it's not like you're pretending. And you want to make sure that you do whatever you can to basically uh, elevate everybody's knowledge, everybody's um, either technical knowledge or knowledge about the customer or knowledge about techniques. You just want to, whatever it is you've learned, you want to bring that around. But without, without the chest beating that comes from somebody who really wants to be known as the best, right? You just want to just spread the wealth. And those are the most effective and inspiring leaders that I've worked with. And that's, that's who I really have wanted to emulate. Steve, Kathy, Thomas, thank you guys so much uh, for your time today. Uh, this, was, this was really entertaining. This was really impactful. And I think we've, we've gotten a lot of great feedback. Um, so for those that are still on, just give us another two minutes. We're going to launch a poll. Launch poll. As always, we'd like to know how we did today. Please rate us one to five. And then if you haven't introduced yourself on Slack yet, yes or no, or, or will you be doing that soon? And then we're taking next week off from the webinars, but we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, so hopefully we'll see you in two weeks. Uh, but before we, we recap, I just want to actually thank Vivin. Um, if you aren't per familiar with Vivin, Vivin is a, a platform that is there to make pre-sales your, comp your company's most strategic asset. Uh, they are a platform built for our organization. If you see the image of marketing, SDR, sales, pre-sales, they have built a product for us, for leaders. I uh, want to thank Vivin and Vivin's team for helping sponsor today's webinar and helping with the Pre-Sales Collective in our growth. So thank you for them. Feel free to check them out on G2 as well. 
And then again, Slack. So big thank you to Brian Mazzaferi. He's an enterprise solution engineer at Slack. He's been taking lead on our Slack environment. And so we have a community that's over 200 plus people in the last week. Uh, get on, introduce yourself. We have some mentoring programs of virtual coffees. We have help uh, channels. It's been really fun watching this network grow. We have local geos as well. So uh, if you're looking to connect with local SEs in your area, you can do that as well. So definitely go to presalescollective.com slash Slack. And then announcing our June webinars. I'm really excited for this. Um, we're gonna have Todd Jansen, who's the global VP of solutions engineering at QBranch uh, at Salesforce on, and we're talking about tapped out, stressed out, stop making unicorns out of your SEs. And then on June 16th, we have the sales excellence. It's all about the demo, right? I'm really excited about this one. As you can see, it's 10 a.m. GMT. So our global audience, we're gonna be doing a, a webinar for our global audience. So most of the US will probably be sleeping during that time, uh, but we're really, really excited for this one. The sales excellence guys and Tim and Jan are great. And Don Carmichael is, is a stalwart in the industry. So we're really looking forward to those two webinars. Also, I'd like to announce the pre-sales podcast. So we've been having a lot of fun the last two months uh, with Pre-Sales Collective. And we've had a lot of great conversations like we did today on the webinar, but we wanna go a step further. We wanna go a step deeper. So go to Spotify, iTunes, you'll be able to follow or subscribe. We have our preview episode out. We've got about five episodes already recorded and we'll be pushing everything out without the next two weeks. Uh, really excited for that one and really highlighting uh, the people in our industry that are making an impact. And then again, our bi-weekly newsletter, Beyond the Demo, it's been great to see, uh, great to hear perspective, highlight the community. Uh, so thank you for your commitment and thanks for supporting that. So with that, uh, thank you. And actually we'll see you in two weeks. So thanks for your time today. Again, Steve, Kathy, Thomas, thank you for your perspectives. Have a great day, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thank Take you. care. Bye.